afternoon. Welcome to Tier 3. Welcome to my kitchen. It's a bit Tier 3. Hope we're all good. Kettle's boiled. So I'm just making some tea. Um, we're going to talk about uh, going to talk about teams today. Um, kind of want to make a good team. That's what we do. Did something on team dynamics a little while ago, but I'm just going to go a little bit deeper onto teams today. Well, that's what we do. Uh, I've got Jamie Dodger today. Nice Jamie Dodger. I've obviously got a question. I've got a question. It's, it's team related. Team related. Um, Anybody who knows me knows I like a bit of football. Um, you don't have to be a football expert to know the answer to this. Um, so my question today, successful team, football. This is like senior, proper, grown-up men's football. Men's football. Um, I apologise, but it's men's football. I think it's most in the, in the world anyway. But what is the longest winning, uh, not winning, what is the longest unbeaten run that a football team's had? How many games? So how many games? Longest unbeaten run. Um, that's my question today. There was a few people. I know there's not a few people. Don't know. Maybe I'll. So longest unbeaten run in football. Like senior football. That is not like boys football or something. When you win about 500 games on the shot. Um, you get a bonus point if you can name the team. If anybody can name the team as well. So longest unbeaten run in football. Um, yeah, anybody have a guess? Longest unbeaten run in football. How many games? How many games? Well, nobody's guessing. Sad times. I have a biscuit. Anyway, we'll talk about teams. Uh, hopefully, someone will guess. Hopefully, somebody's going to guess. Otherwise, my question will be redundant. A few more people to join. My question, 12, 12 matches. I'll give you a clue. It's more than that, Clara. I think Man City have won something like 17 on the trot already this season. So it's definitely more than 12. Um, and this is unbeaten, so they might have drawn some as well. So they might have drawn some. Oh, no, there we are. So um, football, not your sport, clearly, Clara. <laughs> um, <laughs> So just to let you know, teams like play about 40 games, 50 games a season, including cups. So that kind of thing. Anyway, right, we'll talk about teams. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today, I hope someone else gets it, otherwise Clara's one with 12. Um, so we're talking about teams, but what I'm going to talk about primarily is something called the five dysfunctions of a team by a guy called Patrick Lencioni, who's written quite a few books, but I particularly like his, um, his guide about teams and the five dysfunctions. There is a book available, and there it is, Overcoming the Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Um, really good book, um, so you can have a little recommendation there as well. And the reason I'm quite interested in teams is because, A, of sport, which I have a bit of a passion for, but also just because we were working, a lot of us work in teams as well. And and there's always this thing about what's a team and, and you know, do we all work in a team and it's really important. And, you know, the first thing is really to identify what a team is. That's a big thing. Um, and it is generally people working towards one goal. So joint goal. That, that's a big thing with a team. A group is just a group of people all doing the same thing. But the team is very reliant on it. So like in football or any sport, cricket, rugby, one person doesn't perform, then that can impact negatively on the whole team. Yeah, and the team result will go. But you kind of win together and you lose together in sport. And that's the kind of same in teams. Now, there's, a, there's a, a fleet of models out there about what makes a great team and all of that kind of stuff. But I said, I'm going to focus on Lencioni and his five dysfunctions. Kind of says, what are the five things that can cause the biggest problems in teams? And they're like a little hierarchy. So they kind of, you know, you have to have one at the bottom to move up to the next one, et cetera, et cetera. So the five things, I'll just let you know what they are. The, fir the first thing they suggest um, that, that teams sometimes don't have is, is, is trust. So it's an absence of trust. And without trust, the team can never, never work. That's that's the first thing. The second thing is the fear of conflict. So some teams have trust, but then they're slightly concerned about conflict. The third thing is a lack of commitment, a lack of commitment to what the team's trying to achieve. The fourth is avoidance of accountability. And right at the top, there's inattention to results. 
So these five things at various stages in the team um, can, cause the, can cause the problems. So I'm just going to spend a few moments on each of those and kind of what they can look like and what we should be striving for. But firstly, the absence of trust. So trust I've spoken about, and, you know, I've referenced some work by Simon Sinek on what trust is, and it takes a long time to build it, but a very short moment to break it. But a team's got to have trust. You've got to trust the people you work with. And um, also use sport as an analogy quite a lot. Um, I think another place that we, we use that, uh, we see a team is, is perhaps in the military. And, and you know, if people are out on manoeuvres or something like that, it's about another team member has got their back. Um, that's one of the things. So has another team member got their back? And you trust that person who's who's facing the other way, quite literally with your life. So that level of trust is absolutely massive. And in work, you know, yes, we don't know, we don't have to have that 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 high level of trust in that respect. Excuse me, I've just got to be honest, I've just got a little bit of running nose there. Uh, it's just caught me. Uh, that's better. That's live blowing of the nose. Um, so they, there's that absence of trust. Now, there's certain things like uh, one of the things is called predictive trust, where um, colleagues I work with, you know, that what's, what, what do we mean by predictive trust? We well, might have a friend or a colleague, and you know, they're perhaps always going to be late or something like that. They're going to they're going to approach a project in a certain way, and that's what we call predictive trust. But, but Lenzi only talks about deep-seated trust, um, like that, am I willing to let somebody guard my back? How can, we, how can we get that? Well, firstly, we've got to invite vulnerability, so the leader can really start that off. And again, vulnerability is something I've spoken about, but it's, it's absolutely fundamental to building trust. If people are willing to, to, to show what they can and they can't do, it builds a level of trust in the team that we're willing to, to work with. Now, that's the trust level. The second thing, of course, is fear of conflict. And then he only talks about a continuum almost. So on this side, you've kind of got fake harmony where people are almost pretending that they're getting on and everything's lovely. And then over on this side, you've got almost all out war with mean, horrible comments being made. Well, we don't want either end of those. So we do kind of want to sit somewhere in the middle, bizarrely, because it's important we do have a little bit of conflict. Because what we've got is, a, is an environment where people are willing to give their ideas. Again, the leader can encourage this by sharing, uh, by listening, by allowing um, debate and discussion and collaborative dis decisions. Um, there's various tools out there, things like Thomas Kilman um, can, can always can always kind of help with with what makes a team, uh, what how what kind of conflict is in the team but it's kind of crucial that conflict exists in the team a healthy conflict there should be healthy conflict but it's all right to be different but not mean-spirited and not just fake harmony the third layer is about lack of commitment do people know what they're actually buying into do you know what that what are they actually giving to the team that's where things like team charters are really useful so this is what the team stands for. Even team values. A lot of organisational values are out there. But you have team values for the, for the team that you're in at work. Are there, is there something that you've bought into? And the committed team, they'll do things. They'll do things at speed. And they're willing to take things on their own individually within the team. So they'll change. If they get it wrong, they'll move. So they'll, they'll move quickly and change direction if they have to. But you have to have that, what am I committed to? And the only way you can be committed is if you're not concerned about conflict and being chastised by your team, and also you trust the people you're working with. So you can see how these already interweave. The fourth is avoidance of accountability. So how can we become accountable? Well, certainly goals. There's got to be a flow of goals from team to individual, and even higher than that, business team to individual. Um, so there has to be the goals. There has to be clarity on roles within. And I'm sure there's many of us who've all, who've all worked with our job description for ages. Um, and, and that's kind of unhealthy in a team because that, that immediately brings an avoidance of accountability because there's nothing that I'm there with. But we can give open and honest feedback to people within our team. And that last thing is the inattention to results. Are we a results-focused team? 
Are we picking that up? What do we celebrate? How do we celebrate? How regularly do we celebrate? Is there that clear public declaration of what we've achieved? Dashboards of success and progress. And you can see these five things are, are the classic hierarchy. I can't possibly focus on my results without a level of accountability. I can't be accountable if I'm not committed to my team. I can't be committed if I'm concerned about potential conflict. And how can I um, be, be um, comfortable with conflict if I have no trust in the people I work with? So these five things interweave and you have to have them together. It's not something that we just do one thing. And of course, building a successful team takes over a period of time. Now, it doesn't matter if we're face to face in an office, whether we're remote or whether on a field of sporting play. Um, those five things are, are kind of intrinsic to the success of a team. I've used this model with, with quite a few clients. And you kind of talk about these five things. And um, suddenly somebody will say, oh, yeah, I get that. That's just like. Oh, and yeah, do you know what? This has happened to me. So it's a very clear, simple model. And that's why I like Lencioni. Like I say, I've got a nice field guide. Get a hold of that. Have a little read if you want to know more about teams. Now, I'm very disappointed because it looks like Clara might win. But if anybody wants to throw in a late guess, the longest unbeaten run in football. Anybody want to have a go? Anybody want to put anything in? Otherwise, begrudgingly, I've got to give it to Clara. Um, longest unbeaten run in football before I sign off. Well, Clara's 12 is indeed the closest, but it is in fact 106 games, and it was by a Romanian team called Stau Bucharest. Um, so that's the longest unbeaten run in world football, 106 games. So everybody, have a great afternoon, whatever you're doing. <laughs> yeah, winner, winner, chicken dinner, Clara. Um, have a, just 100, no, 194, that's not too bad. And have a great afternoon, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Take care. Have a good day.